Welcome to Act Three of Richard Strauss's Rosen Cavalier. As many of you will know, we played the first two acts of this enchanting musical comedy last week. But for those who may have missed the beginning of Rosen Cavalier, I would like to tell you the story up to now, if I may. Our opera takes place in Vienna in the middle of the 18th century, and it is about a noble princess, the Marshalin, and Octavian, the Count Rofrano, who are in love. A distant cousin of the lady, Baron Ox von Lerschenau, comes to Vienna one fine morning to visit the Marshalin because he is getting married and needs her advice. The fact is, she is just having breakfast with young Octavian and doesn't think it is a good idea at all for the Baron to find that young man in her company so early in the day. But it is too late for Octavian to escape, and so he decides to stay quickly disguising himself as the Marshalin's personal maid, Mariano. Well, Baron Ox is fooled all right, and almost too much so, because he begins to take a, a rather lively interest in the supposed maid. He is so enchanted with her lovely looks that he almost forgets the purpose of his visit. It is the Viennese custom for a nobleman to send a member of his family to the home of his chosen bride with a silver rose as a token of his intention to marry her. In a playful mood, the Marshalin recommends none other than Count Octavian himself as the Rosen Cavalier the bearer of the rose, and when shown the young gentleman's picture, the baron is struck by the resemblance between him and Mariando, and little does the marshalin foresee how dearly she will have to pay for her harmless joke. Now the second act took us to the palace of Fanfaninal, where the baron's fiancée was anxiously awaiting her husband-to-be, whom she had never seen. She is not particularly pleased when she finally meets Baron Ox, but is completely taken with Count Octavian who appears clad all in shining silver to present the rose as he had promised. The Baron is his usual rustic self, and his crude manners shock Sophie terribly, but not more than they shock Octavian, who has fallen in love with Sophie at first sight. Finally, Octavian becomes so incensed that he challenges the Baron, the Baron Ox, to a duel and gives him a slight scratch almost as soon as the duel has begun. Baron Ox carries on as if he were dying. But the doctor and a bottle of good wine do wonders in soothing his ruffled nerves. And to make him perfectly happy, he has brought a letter from Mariandel, the supposed maid, that says, I am free Tuesday evening after eight. I liked you a lot, but I was ashamed in my lady's presence. I'm still so young and bashful. I hope you will answer. Well, the Baron is the happiest man in all Vienna, and little does he think that the whole thing is a trap set for him by Count Octavian or that the pretty Mariandel, with whom he expects to have such a wonderful date for Tuesday after 8, is none other than the Count himself. Just one thing more. The role of Count Octavian is sung by a girl. Strauss wrote the role for a mezzo-soprano because he felt a mature tenor could not properly portray an adolescent boy, nor could he sustain the high vocal range of a boy of 17. Now let's join the fun in an old-fashioned beer house somewhere in a not too respectable part of Vienna, where Octavian has hired two conspirators, Falsaki and Anina, to help him carry out his plan to conquer Baron Ox. Ladies and gentlemen, the last act of Richard Strauss's Rosen Cavalier. <laughs>
pardon your lordship. Have you any further orders? Perhaps more candles. Have you enough room here? Yeah. Perhaps candles. more silver for your meal. More silver. Get up. You will upset a little girl. And why the music didn't ask for it? Would you prefer to have them play nearby? They sit outside in the music. Just leave the music where it is. Tell me, what is this window for? That's not a window, sir. They will begin to serve. Stop. While this grasshopper's there, we serve you, you at dinner. dinner. Don't need no one. Get out. No waiters. My man here will serve the meal. And I will fill the glasses. You get me? What was that? 
did you see over there? There's nothing there. Nothing there. No, here's nothing either. That is my face. That is your face, and nothing there. I must have seen some kind of
By mere coincidence, I am the person name yourself. I am the noble Pertaminal. Then do you agree that that man there is your son-in-law? Indeed, no reason why I should not know him. Perhaps because he wears no hair. Perhaps you kindly will refresh your failing memory and recognize your future in-law. Maybe, perhaps for all I know, that may be so. It seems that all this evening I've been out of sorts. I think my eyes have played before. Let me tell you, there's something in the air tonight that makes you lose your mind. Foreigner, 
You don't admit that that young woman over there could be your daughter. Is that it? Not that rag there. That's my daughter. You mean to say she says she is? She's waiting for me downstairs. Hey, so hurry up. If you will regret this, I will go to court. And who are these? A dwindle. I have never seen her. She lied. She said she was my lawful wife. You might as well believe the Christmas trees fit in. The whole of Yellow Town, the Yellow Town. Hey, they will point at me at last. The whole of Yellow Town. Oh. You will see, this is too much, come help That should clear up the matter. I pay, I go. I take you home, my dear. Come again. I am by no means so with you. Officer, I want to make a statement, but the Baron mustn't hear it. I've never seen that hag. I swear, I was just eating. I can't imagine what she wants. Would I have called you if she was my wife? What is going on? I do not trust my eyes. He's peeping. A fine police you've been this town. You can't do that. You can't do that. And for God, I want you. I will see that you are punished. I have to speak to her. Yes, Your Highness, the princess, the most gracious mom. Highness, that is me. You better stay there. Don't come out. I don't know what to say. Marie Therese, I don't quite know. There's something that my father wants to tell you. This hardly is the time to speak when you ask. And you patient till I shall send for you. Oh, you I I can get to the lady. She is charming. I will not ever give you any chance to introduce me, because I do not wish to have that much to do with you. 
And this is what I want to tell you. If you dare to go so far in your presumption and to show your nose within a hundred paces from our home or in the neighborhood, then you have no one but yourself to blame for what may happen. This is the message I was supposed to give to you. For God, the battle was a special kind of disrespect language. Hey, funny, now I'm mad. I'm willing to forget what happened. For once I will forgive your bad behavior. You my permission to withdraw now. It's time. Why should I? Where is your dignity? You'd better go. I what? So you can smile in spite of all. Then you'll retain the semblance of a gentleman. You see, it's clear enough. It's all nothing more than a fancy. And that is all. Your Highness, I'll withdraw with your permission. It was nothing more than a fancy. I've no intention. I've no intention. I've no intention. I have no intention. I have no I That's what I thought. That face, it makes me sick. It was not my eyesight after all. He's not a female. It was a harmless little masquerade and nothing more. Uh -huh. It was a harmless little masquerade and nothing more. They all are. In a league together to defeat me. You would have paid me dearly if my girl Marion should have really fallen sick to your wild. Right now, I have a person of a friend. Against all men together. What is all this? I'm getting more and more amazed. The marshal gone. Octavian. Mariandu. The marshaling. Oh, One thing is sure, there is a great confusion of no one to think of it. Delicious. 
with a gracious quid pro quo, but I must follow more, insist that you should speak for me. I gladly show my generosity. I'm willing to forget the whole adventure. Eh bien, may I call Fanny Nile? You may, you may put on your hat to please the people. Must you be told when you're no longer welcome? Go be the courtship, and everything that you have fancied, you will and will forget. What you had fancied, you might just and well forget. I might as well forget. I might as well forget as well forget as well forget. We are leaving. Oh, my God. 
about how justly I was instead over the conduct of that paradox. You may believe me. I feel forever grateful for your help and kind assistance. Surely not talk so much. Your looks will speak for you and for your father's position. I may know remedy for that. I think I'll have a word with him. I will suggest that you and he and cause of power should arise beside me in my carriage. Don't you think this would act as a stimulant and help a bit to speed up his recovery? Every time, and for your paleness, well, I think my cousin there may not you. I don't, I don't, don't. 
don't know.
just seen the NBC Opera Theatre's final production of the current season, Act Three of Richard Strauss's Rosenkavalier.
Ladies and gentlemen, with the conclusion of today's performance of Strauss's Rosenkavalier, we've come to the end of the fifth season of the NBC Television Opera Theater. During this period, NBC has presented 25 programs devoted to the best of operatic literature, both classical and modern, all in special English versions, of course, adapted for television. From the popular classical operatic repertory, we have brought you the following operas. Madame Butterfly, Carmen, Tales of Hoffman, the Fledermaus, the Barber of Seville, Pagliacci and Hansel and Gretel, and the complete fourth act of La Boheme. Now, among the classical operas, possibly more rarely heard, we have presented the Queen of Spades, as well as Menotti's Old Maid and the Thief, Offenbach's RSVP, and the three one-act operas by Puccini, Gianni Schicchi, The Cloak, and Sister Angelica. And we do feel a special responsibility to bring out the best of the new operas by modern American and European composers. The new operas presented by the NBC Television Opera Theater have been Kurt Wilde's Down in the Valley, Leonard Bernstein's Trouble in Tahiti, Benjamin Britten's Billy Budd in its American premiere, Bohuslav Martinu's The Marriage, that was its world premiere, and of course the, the Christmas opera Amal and the Night Visitors by Giancarlo Minotti, which was especially commissioned by NBC for the TV Opera Theater and which in two short years has become recognized as a modern classic. And during the first five years of our existence, uh, we have been feeling our way and learning our craft. The special requirements of television as a new medium have forced us to change many of the traditions associated uh, with grand opera and to bring forward a more, shall we say, realistic style of presentation in which our singing actors present a convincing characterization. We have abolished the broad gesture and the stereotyped characterization from our opera theater, and we hope that we are on the road to creating a new style for opera, which will eventually become known as the American style. And we have gathered together the beginnings of an operatic stock company. And uh, those of you who have followed our broadcasts in the last several years must have recognized many familiar faces in the production of Rosen Cavalier, which you've just witnessed. At the same time, we permit no star system, and many of our artists who take leading parts in one production are seen again as bit players in another. All partake of a spirit of creative cooperation which recognizes that there is no such thing as an insignificant role. Every detail is important, and this group of distinguished young American artists will continue to work together under the banner of the NBC Television Opera Theater. Next year, we will present another full season of television opera as we have in the past, bringing to the American TV audience the, the best of opera, both modern and classic. The names of the operas to be presented will be announced early next fall. And this is Robert Denton speaking. <laughs>